Thank you. Thank you. Singapore, glitzy, glamorous, and spectacularly wealthy. There's only one problem. Behind the facade is this. Singapore has been under one-party rule for more than 50 years. And in that time, opposition members of parliament, labor leaders, activists, journalists have been imprisoned for decades without trial, sued for defamation until bankrupt, and prosecuted every time we come together in public in groups of five or more. Even until today, activists continue to come under threat. An independent filmmaker who had documented the allegations of some bus drivers who, had, who were jailed for going on strike for better pay and who had said that they were beaten during questioning was itself threatened with legal action. A cartoonist who had criticized the government through his illustrations was arrested and accused of sedition. A 21-year-old blogger who had criticized, uh, complained against a government agency, found herself threatened with defamation suit. The attorney general had sent letters to bloggers who had posted articles and comments about uh, criticizing the judiciary, was threatened with uh, charges of contempt of court. And all this, all this in the last several weeks, the message is clear. I know what you're thinking. How is all this possible in a place like this? It's not really very hard to understand. Investors, foreign investors, love places like Singapore, where the government is pro-business and where people's rights, in particular human rights, workers' rights, are kept strictly in abeyance. No minimum wage, no independent trade unions, no civil liberties. And these foreign investors bring in the millions of dollars. And Singapore has the highest concentration of millionaires in the world. It is therefore no surprise that we also have the highest income inequality among advanced countries, including that of the United States. And so while the rich think nothing of paying $20,000 for a cocktail, a glass of diamond champagne, they call it. The poor, the elderly, have to scavenge and struggle just to eke out a living. And the question is not whether authoritarian systems generate economic growth. Obviously, they do. And they have. Russia, China, Singapore have posted impressive GDP growth in the last few decades. Rather, the question is, is such growth sustainable? Darren Esimoglu and James Robinson wrote the book Why Nations Fail. And in it, they surveyed the vast expanse of economic development through time, from ancient Peru during the Inca period, empire, to the glorious revolution of 17th century Britain, to latter-day Koreas. And they found that institutions that govern economies and states broadly fell into two categories, extractive and inclusive institutions. Extractive institutions, the ones where power is concentrated in the hands of a few and where resources are extracted by, from the many for the few, cause states to wilt and die. Inclusive institutions, on the other hand, that practice pluralism, where they involve masses in the polity and economy, encourage innovation, and in doing so, allow states to progress. Russia, China, Singapore employ extractive institutions, going forward, sustaining the economic growth as they have in the past few decades is seriously in question. And indeed, the Russian economy is starting to wobble. The Chinese economy uh, is, seems to be losing steam as well. In the first quarter of this year, it posted less than expected 
GDP growth alarming uh, the world. And compared to some of the other economies in the region, Singapore is struggling. Whereas economies like Indonesia and, and Thailand and Philippines post a record GDP growth of averaging 6% and up, Singapore managed only 1.3%. Inclusive institutions are needed for progress. In other words, criticism and dissent are needed for economic sustainability. And Singaporeans know this. They know that change is needed. And they want to see that change. And they also know that we are the only ones that can effect, bring about that change. No one else. They're beginning to speak up. The early campaign for freedom of speech and assembly conducted by them have evolved into veritable movements conducted by them. And when you get into a stage where the government is now faced with what to do with such a desire, such a push for change, it can act in one of two ways. If it continues with its extractive policies and continue to clamp down on the people's rights, our economy is going to continue with its downward drift. But if they build in incentives to bring about an inclusive system, the economy will have be able to be sustained. On a larger scale, the ex experience of Singapore has an important lesson for the rest of the world, in particular the developing world. In our effort to reduce poverty, to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, we often focus on fixing the economic institutions without concomitantly looking at reforming political institutions. We speak of politics and economics as if they were completely separate universes. In that light, should economists uh, and, and plan, uh, policy makers uh, be nestled in Davos, Switzerland, whereas your political and human rights uh, actors be gathered here in Oslo, Norway? Uh, is it an idea for the Oslo Freedom for Forum uh, to come together with the world economic freedom uh, to bring together protagonists of the economics and human rights spheres to see if we can chart out a more effective way of bringing about a more just and better world. I want to leave you with this picture that has gripped the world. It is, shows the, a couple in tight embrace just before they died when the building collapsed in Bangladesh. It killed more than 1,000 low-income workers who are producing garments for billion-dollar Western companies. In the rush to increase boost profit margins, the manufacturers had ignored egregious breaches of building safety codes. It is a poignant a reminder that the poor, they cry, they fear, they laugh, they Hope, just like the rich, their lives are worth no less. I want to thank the organizers for having me and you for your patience. I feel a sense of kindred spirits, for I know you will continue the important work of speaking truth to power and empowering the powerless. Uh, ours is a common endeavor to bring about a world richly endowed with justice justice in its most noble and profound sense. Thank you. Thank you.